Okay, everybody, welcome to this edition of Campus Conversations. My name is Dan Mogoloff. I'm with the Campus Office of Communications and Public Affairs. And today, and with all due respect to Batman and Robin, we have a true dynamic duo. Um, and I will introduce them shortly. And as per our usual practice, each will have a bit to say about what they're currently doing, um, the status of their area of responsibility, and as well as some visions for the future. And then again, we welcome questions. Index cards are on your seat for that purpose. Once you've filled them out, just hold them up. Totally fine to do that once the conversation gets away. So just a, a brief inter introduction for Kathy Koshlin and Fiona Doyle. Fiona Doyle is the Vice Provost for Graduate Studies and Dean of the Graduate Division. In that capacity, she oversees all of Berkeley's graduate programs and our 10,000 plus graduate students. Fiona obtained her bachelor's degree from the University of Cambridge and her master's and doctorate from Imperial College, University of London. She joined the faculty at UC Berkeley in 1983 and was appointed to the Donald H. McLaughlin Chair in Mineral Engineering in 1998. She has served as Chair of the Department of Material Science and Engineering, Executive Associate Dean of the College of Engineering, and Vice Chair and Chair of the Berkeley Division of the Academic Senate. Fiona's research focuses on the chemical aspects of minerals and materials processing. If you have any questions about that, send them up. <laughs> and materials solution interactions with the goal of developing a sustainable supply of resources and energy. She has taught a wide range of graduate and undergraduate courses. Kathy Koshland is the Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education and the Wood Calvert Professor in the College of Engineering. She is a Professor of Environmental Health Sciences in the School of Public Health and a professor in the Energy and Resources Group. Professor Koshlin graduated with a BA in Fine Arts from Haverford College, studied painting at the New York School of Drawing, Painting, and Sculpture, and received her MS in 1978 and her PhD in 1985 in mechan mechanical engineering from... That other stool. Stanford? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll, <clears throat> we'll talk about that later. Um, she is... But she made up for it because she is a past parent at Cal with a daughter, Sarah, a 1999 graduate, and daughter, Maggie, a 2002 graduate. Full compensation. Among Vice Chancellor Koshlin's responsibilities are major operating units, including summer sessions, study abroad, and lifelong learning, the Athletic Study Center, the Student Learning Center, et cetera, et cetera. We'll go on. We'll be talking more about that. But Fiona, if I could ask you just to kick it off with some comments. Well, first of all, I want to know which one's Batman and which one's Robin. <laughs> I go <ain't> going there. <laughs> Let me start on this, Dad. <laughs> so um, lots of people kind of ask me, well, what is it that the graduate division actually does? Or even what is the graduate division? Um, the latter question is a bit too complicated, um, which means that I don't really know the answer. But um, in, uh, as Dan mentioned, um, I oversee, um, I and my colleagues, we oversee all of Berkeley's students, and actually we're now up to about 11,500, so um, it's a fast-moving target, um, keeps on increasing. And the graduate division oversees um, graduate, uh, graduate students really from kind of cradle to grave. We oversee the, well, not quite, but <laughs> a cradle to grave academically. Um, <laughs> We oversee them um, as they're doing their applications. The graduate division is the entity that actually admits graduate students to Berkeley. We then track their progress on milestones towards their degrees, whether these be doctoral degrees, master's degrees, professional degrees. Um, and while the students are here, we also provide um, resources for financial support of graduate students, which um, for our doctoral students takes the form of fellowships. Um, we also oversee the complex dance that um, graduate students do moving from one form of support to another in terms of fellowships, um, GSR appointments, um, and GSI appointments. And then um, we provide resources, training graduate student instructors to, um, for their first teaching appointment and then support as they grow as teachers. We provide professional development um, support. And then um, at the end of it, um, 
we um, proudly um, ensure that our students have satisfied their degree requirements. Um, there's a tradition in the graduate um, division when graduate um, students submit their dissertations. Um, bring their, it's now just bringing their um, title page to us, which we archive. Um, it used to be that they brought the whole dissertation. But that's now done electronically. But the big thing is that they get a lollipop at the end of it. <laughs> and so we have a standing order with C's candies for um, lollipops that are dispensed at the end of it all. Students um, file their dissertations. So that's probably enough to get going on. <laughs> So I'll just add, I'm actually also a current pa Cal parent. My, my uh, youngest, um, Jake, is getting his MBA at Haas and has just started his second year. So, um, he's one of mine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he is. Um, so the undergraduate division has often gets the same questions. What do you do as, as a vice chancellor for undergraduate education? And I would say we have two roles. I'll mention the first one, which is a management role that involves all of the support, academic support services and academic programs that um, roll up to, to, to me. So that includes things like um, the Athletic Study Center, the Student Learning Center, um, all of research and teaching, learning IT, um, Center for Teaching and Learning, the whole division of summer sessions, study abroad and lifelong learning, um, and then numerous um, faculty-led programs like the Collegium and um, Berkeley Connect, for example. So those are all the, the, the vast variety of things that sort of roll up to us. The other role we have, besides sort of making, things the, making the trains run, is a strategic role in working collaboratively with all of the undergraduate um, colleges and their deans, um, as well as with the dean of the business school. So there's sort of 10 deans that we work with. I convene a council of college deans which has really been instrumental in helping us talk strategically about what we're doing for undergraduates. Um, and, and really working collaboratively also with Oscar Dubon in equity and inclusion and with Steve Sutton in um, student affairs around the undergraduate experience, around the student experience, but a real focus and collaboratively the three of us have joined forces in a variety of ways um, to be able to be effective across the many resources that we have that support the student experience um, and, and make us more efficient together and not siloed. Great, and again, just to remind for folks who just came in, there's index cards on your chairs. If you have questions, write them down, hold them up in the air. But I wanna start off, if you don't mind, with a couple of my own. Kathy, let me start with you. Sometimes if you read the Daily Cal, you would think that it's just an absolute nightmare being, a, <laughs> you know, being an undergraduate at UC Berkeley. Tough to get classes, tough to get by, tough to navigate. Help us a little bit with sort of fact and fiction and how you assess the current sort of the state of the union in terms of our undergraduate offerings and the student experience here. So first, I have to say, I'm, I'm a little bit on a, on a rampage at the moment to change our dialogue. Why are you and, looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I think there's, there's an element where we say so much about how hard this place is and how tough it is that we actually induce stress rather than help alleviate it. And I think part of what I would love to see us do is change the way in which we talk to students about what their experience is, certainly support them, because they do run into challenges. There are stressful moments. There's no denying that. But if we start out from the very beginning talking as if this place is an impossible lift, that's what our students are going to feel. And so I'd like to think of, think of us as being a place that, that challenges folks. And what I would like to say is instead of the story being you know, the bar is here and, you know, the old, the old Berkeley would be the bar is here and when you reach it, we'll talk to you. And I would prefer to say the bar is here. You might be here or here or here. We're going to support you and help you get there. And we think you can get there. And it's a matter of how we help you navigate that, how we help you get there. And that's what I'd like us all to be thinking about is that positive message that once you've been admitted to Berkeley, we expect you to succeed. And, and our job is to help you figure out a way to to do that, giving, you know, every student we've admitted comes in with assets. And it's a matter of helping them understand that they have those assets, where are the things where they don't know quite what to do, and, and help them along the way, rather than sending a message of, oh, this place is so hard. So in that context then, and the chancellor has talked about improving the undergraduate experience, what are the things that we're doing? What are some of the changes that are in the works 
What are some of the initiatives that you're looking at going forward in that regard? So I think one of the key things is we do want it to be a place where students can get the courses that they want. So that's, that's going to be part of the strategy as we move forward, finding the resources that let us do that. We certainly prioritized key classes for students. And in fact, um, with the exception of things like Robert Reich's class, which only 700 students are going to get in every semester. Um, you know, there, we, we really do try to meet the, that, that fundamental need. Part of what we are embarking on is a, a, a project called Major Maps, which is going to be for each major a navigation pathway, not just for the major and your classes, but um, ideas for internship, study abroad, a number of things that will integrate and that will be a, a useful guide for students, for advisors, for parents to see what you can do. And part of what we hope that does is actually let students see that there aren't just about six majors you could do around here. I mean, really, we have four economics majors. We're not all going to be ec economists. So let's broaden our landscape of what we can do and help students see that there are alternative pathways that many, many CEOs of companies were philosophy majors. English majors, history majors, you don't have to major in econ to be a successful business person or to go to law school or whatever those things are. So part of it is, is creating a, a way in which students can, can both find their way through here and also embrace the many, many opportunities that exist for them. Thanks, Fiona. I want to ask you, I mean, the campus is now in the process of digging itself out of a pretty deep financial hole, but I know that at the, at the depths of our challenges, there was a lot of concern about our ability to remain competitive with graduate students, to support them financially, to um, counteract any narrative that the university was in a state of decline, which it clearly wasn't. Where do, where do things stand now? How are we doing in, in sort of in the, uh, from a competitive perspective? And just as a, on a sort of substantive basis, our ability to provide graduate students with what they need. How do you assess where we are right now? So um, I'm actually very proud of the progress that we've made in the last few years. So um, first of all, I'd like to just clarify that there are really two different populations of graduate students. There are students who are following doctoral programs, and there are students who are following professional programs. And the default around here, when people talk about graduate students, they're normally thinking of doctoral students. Doctoral students are actually now a minority of the graduate students on the Berkeley campus. Um, and this is by design. Um, we have fairly limited ability to support graduate students, and doctoral students in particular. And so I have been working with departments to um, ensure that they understand that if they admit fewer doctoral students, they will still get the same financial support from central resources, um, so that they have more money per student, which means that each student can be better supported. Um, nobody likes this. We would rather have more money and be able to support more doctoral students, but given that we have a limited budget, everybody agrees that we want the doctoral students that we have to be properly supported. So um, this year, um, more than 50% of the doctoral applicants to whom we offered admission chose to come to Berkeley. This is statistically, frankly, a miracle, because these are incredibly well-qualified students who all of the Ivy Leagues are vying for. We know that each of these students who's been offered admission to Berkeley has a few really good financial aid offers, often better than the financial aid offers that we're able to provide them. And they choose to come to Berkeley because we have an amazing faculty. Our students report that they chose to come to Berkeley because they really want to work with Professor X and Professor Y. And then one of our enormous strengths is our comprehensive excellence. So given that most doctoral education is um, you know, very interdisciplinary these days, even if a student is in a particular department, the cutting edge of knowledge requires drawing um, on other disciplines. And because of our comprehensive excellence, students realize that they're going to be able to do work at Berkeley that they wouldn't be able to do at Harvard or at MIT or name your prestigious school. 
And so we're, we're doing incredibly well. Um, then I want to talk about our professional students as well, because these are now the majority of our graduate students. Um, talking of um, narratives that I think have got mess messed up, there has been in the last few years a very unfortunate narrative that we are increasing our professional programs, the numbers of them and the students enrolled in each, to raise revenues. Um, that is not the reason why we're increasing our um, numbers of professional students. We're doing it because increasingly professional degrees are entry-level qualifications. Mm -hmm. um, I really want to ensure that the University of California is providing citizens of the state the opportunity to study and tolerate professional programs. Because if we aren't doing this, then they're going to seek out professional education in institutions that don't give them such great education. I think it's a responsibility of us as a public institution. And it's a responsibility for us to be able to be graduating students who are well prepared to actually support the needs of California employers. You know, so when I, I think things oh, are really good. <laughs> When I met with both of you to sort of prepare for, for this event today, there was a phrase I think, Fiona, you brought up, but I'd like you both to talk about it, and that was the, ver the integration, a vertical integration of our learning communities. And at first I was like, oh, jargon, what does that mean? But thinking about it, you know, there's some interaction, there's the GSIs, but it suggested that there are still sort of two separate bodies that we want to integrate and bring together. What's the vision for that? What's driving that? Um, and what were you referring to? Well, I'm going to let Kathy respond to that because she kind of d coined the phrase around here. Right. So I don't want to steal her thunder because <laughs> it's, it's, it's very visionary and so, Kathy deserves so, the credit. Yeah, for Kathy, it. if you could start off, but I'd also like to hear uh, your I'll, perspective. I'll, yeah. I'll Perfect. Ka Kathy deserves the credit. Right. So, so part of the, the um, I'll, I'll back up and say one thing I didn't answer a previous question, which is. One of the things that we're really focused on is discovery as the organizing principle for the undergraduate education. The only way we're going to be able to really do discovery in the broadest possible way at Berkeley, given the numbers of undergraduates and the numbers of latter faculty, is to leverage one of the assets of a research university, which is our graduate students, our postdocs, our emeritus faculty. That vertical learning community, which has learning going in both directions on any kind of level, um, is, is part of how we will actually achieve the ability for every undergraduate to have a discovery experience, which is ultimately what we, what, where we want to go. And that discovery experience is really one that a student is initiating a project in their area of passion, and they need mentoring for that. And, and guidance, and that can come from any one of these layers. And I'll add also, many of our staff actually have the capacity to also provide that mentorship depending on the kind of project that a student wants to be engaged in. So that's, that's really what, we're, what we're, we're talking about there. And that, that mentoring, that role of mentoring from a, if you think about it, to have our graduate students and, and postdocs involved in that, that's a lifelong skill. In any professional setting, as you move up the ranks, you have a responsibility to mentor your younger colleagues. And so it's, it's something that we all need to know how to do. And what better place to learn it than a place like Berkeley? So I'll, I'll add to that. Um, and in, in my former life, I was an undergraduate dean. So I've been deeply engaged in undergraduate yes. education as well. And I, I just add that one of the reasons why discovery is important is that um, some people in this room can remember 40 years ago. And if you think about the world 40 years ago, um, we, with our undergraduates, are thinking about how to prepare them for careers that will extend for 40 plus years. And we've got no idea what the world's gonna be like. And so discovery is important because it teaches students that they themselves can keep on learning. We can't prepare them for what's there. We have to prepare them to keep on preparing themselves. And that's why it's important. That's an element, of course, of the research that doctoral students are deeply engaged in. And so they are further up the ladder in um, terms of knowing how to 
find out things for themselves and how to create knowledge, actually. So um, in addition to um, the pedagogic benefits of the discovery experience, one of the things that's very much on my mind is actually the well-being of um, doctoral students in particular. Um, my professional students as well, but the doctoral students are here for longer and work-life balance issues. Because when you're in a long degree program, it's, it's easy, and the nature of research is such that it's actually fairly easy to kind of um, develop a cloistered isolation, which is not good for people um, in terms of their mental health. And so the engagement with undergraduates and with um, postdocs in these vertical communities also helps um, graduate students get out of their silos. So um, it really is a win-win in terms of the benefits for everybody. Uh, you both mentioned sort of uh, talked about, um, about what you're doing in ways that sort of revealed the breadth and depth of your experience. And so I want to ask you some time-related questions. In both of your areas, how have you seen students change? I mean, we've seen this emergence of this unfortunate notion of the snowflake student. There have been books written about the coddling of the American mind and that we're protecting students. And they're, looking, they're coming to campuses looking to be protected from ideas they may find offensive or harmful. What have you seen in your time here? And how have students changed? Or have they changed at all? And Fiona, let me start with you. So um, I, I mean, stu students have changed because um, their experiences were totally changed. I mean, when I. Um, started teaching here, you know, for, for the first few years I was here, there was no internet. Um, you know, I imagine that, you know. I, I, I do almost, almost on a daily basis. I say, gosh, I love Wikipedia, you know. I love being able to get information, but we didn't used to be able to do this. So students today, um, they know how to navigate that, that space. Um, and so there are spaces that students in the early 80s navigated that today students aren't as adept at, do, at, do, at doing. So they're different. But the way that we do scholarship is also evolving. And they are still every bit as bright, um, excited to be here. And so it's our job as educators to meet them where they are. They, you know, it's completely futile to say, oh, well, you don't have those skills that the students in the 1980s had. <laughs> um, but instead, we need to recognize the skills that they do have, their engagement, their ability to do teamwork. Mm -hmm. And that opens up the doors to do very exciting things. So you, know, you always have to think about what you have, not what you may not have. That's my view. What do you see? I mean, do, are we being called to provide different sort of environment in the, than we have in the past? Are students I, changed I, in that regard? I think there is. I think it's a complicated space because I would say on the one hand, we probably have a subpopulation of students who um, have had many obstacles removed from their pathways um, by their caring families and don't actually know how to navigate a tough situation don't know how to fend for themselves in a certain way because they actually haven't been, have those skills developed in them. Um, and some of them expect that we will protect them from an uncomfortable idea um, simply because they've been protected from them all their lives. And, and from my perspective, universities are the place to be unsettled and, and be challenged. On the other hand, we also have students who have, have met with an amazing array of life challenges um, and, and for whom this is one more complicated and perhaps somewhat difficult space that they actually, in some ways, have the skills to navigate in certain ways and lack them in others. So I actually see that we have two or three different populations of students, one who've had to be resilient. Maybe they've been the family translator. Maybe they've been a breadwinner within their families. Um, and they're coming here and still trying to do many of those things. The ones who've had everything, the, I call them lawn mowing parents, that everything, every obstacle is smoothed out of the way in front of them. Um, and they really lack certain kinds of skills. So to, to, to balance what Fiona said, it's, it's helping them see what they do have. It's helping them to see what they need to learn. And also helping them grapple with the uncomfortable, with the unsettling, with the, the fact that they're going to come in here and meet different people and have their worldviews rocked in many ways. And rather than protecting them from that, 
I think we need to help them have the skills to respond to that in appropriate ways and, and build on that and learn how to grapple with those uncomfortable concepts, ideas, um, conversations. Um, and that's, that's, that's not easy, um, but, but I think it's something we need to do. So I want to stay with the experiential theme just for a second. Um, given how long both of you have, have had careers in academia, we're living through a remarkable and disturbing moment, the, the whole Me Too movement that's really putting a spotlight on women in the workplace, women in the culture, women in our society. I've heard the chancellor talk on many occasions about what it was like to be one of 3%, um, which was, is alarming and profound. And I'm wondering what changes you've seen in terms of being a woman on faculty or in a position of leadership, how things have changed and what hasn't changed enough. If you could talk about it. Catherine, let me start with you on that one. It's, a, it's an interesting um, a question, one I've often um, reflected on. I, you know, I did some things that, that I think many young women were advised not to do. I had two kids while I was getting my doctoral degree. And I basically um, had one as getting my master's, and then when I went and talked to the chair of our division at Stanford, and I said, I'm going to do my PhD, and he said, great. And I said, and by the way, I'm going to have another kid while I'm here. Do you have a problem with that? <laughs> the answer was, uh, no. <laughs> so I just did what I needed to do. And I think some of it sometimes is just having the courage to indicate what you're going to do and, and follow through on that. Um, I will also say having mentors, I had two mentors here at, at Berkeley and actually a, a, in some ways a third. Um, both of my mentors were men. They, one was in public health, one was in engineering. Um, they were essential to my um, getting through the first part of being an assistant professor. So I don't care whether they're men or women, having a mentor or mentors is, was, was life-saving and, and hugely important. Um, my third mentor was actually my mother-in-law who was on fa the faculty as well and had five kids and an amazing career. And so, you know, there was a role model that I could really follow and, and, and felt supported by in a, in a, in a personal way. So I, I, the other thing I would say is very different is when I was, um, went to have my third child, um, this campus had a six-month um, maternity leave and they had decided to make it a year. And, um, uh, and it, there was complications around that, and I had to sort of had to fight around that. I'm happy to say today that not only do our young faculty have two opportunities to stop the tenure clock, and there's paternity leave as well as maternity leave, and we've extended it to graduate students, to doctoral students. Um, gr graduate students can have um, academic leave, and um, they also have, um, if they are um, graduate student employees, they have some paid leave as well. So, so huge change in terms of our family-friendly policies, which are real in, on this campus, at least for you know, faculty and, 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 and graduate students. And I think that's been a huge change in, at, at Berkeley, and I think we actually led the way um, mm -hmm. in, in making those, those changes. Yeah. Um, well, I think th things have changed for the better. Uh, I, when I came here, I was the third female faculty member in the College of Engineering. So this wasn't like 3%. We'd have loved it. I'd have loved it to have been 3%. It was, I, I, I think I took us from slightly below 1% to slightly above 1%. And I was the only female faculty member in my department for 19 years. I was actually the department chair when the second female faculty member arrived. So um, with that said, um, I mean, my... Um, Colleagues were actually very, very supportive of me. Um, and that was a good thing because um, I was totally clueless. Um, I came, I was educated in England. I had no idea what the American- You came here and you could be clueless too, so. <laughs> you know, I, I had no idea what the American education system was like. You know, I didn't really know why people were say, talking about tenure and hushed tones and things <laughs> like this. So um, I really needed an awful lot of mentoring to actually understand what the whole program was about. Um, and, you know, I, I, so, I mean, that's not to say that I didn't encounter sort of if many incidents of people kind of just being clueless. Um, but, you know, I, I, I never felt that I was discriminated against. And I was actually very lucky in that I had quite a few colleagues who had daughters who were about my age. And it appeared to me that they were, in fact, thinking, hmm, I wouldn't like people to treat my daughter 
in the way that some of the women around here are treated. Um, I'm going to tr treat her, you know, sort of better than that. Um, so they, 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 were, they were really um, sort of very, very sweet. And I sometimes think, because I'm in an academic field, I'm, you know, mining isn't renowned for um, gender diversity. <laughs> and, um, but the, yeah. there, are, there are quite a few fairly prominent women academics. And I often, often wonder whether perhaps um, if there are so few women in the field, then men don't feel threatened, and then they actually, it brings out the better side and they're um, supportive. Because my, many of my peers, um, kind of in my academic field, um, also have felt very supported by um, male people, um, male colleagues. But um, when, uh, unlike Kathy, um, I didn't I have um, my children until I actually had tenure. Um, and I actually, when I was expecting my daughter, I went to my department manager and said, so, you know, what are the arrangements for maternity leave? And she said, I don't think there are any for faculty. So I then went and wasted a perfectly good sabbatical <laughs> on what I subsequently discovered when my, nine, my, my daughter was nine months old. I could have actually taken some maternity leave, but nobody knew about it. Things aren't like wow. that now, and that's actually really, really good. <laughs> So yeah, let me, let's just continue this just for a second and bring it into the present tense. Totally level playing field now, still challenges, still work to be done, where are we? I'd say there's still work to be done. Um, I mean, particularly um, one of my predecessors as a graduate dean, Marianne Mason, has done a huge amount of research on um, women in the workplace. And you know, one sees regular statistics, Angie Stacy does, um, research on our faculty, and we're still seeing that um, women, um, or shall I say mothers, are reporting spending much more time in total um, on work and household responsibilities than male employees in um, similar titles. And until that is really level, things aren't totally level. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think there, again, there are improvements um, uh, one of the statistics that's interesting is, is, you know, prior to our introduction of family-friendly policies, when a woman went up for tenure, she had zero kids. That would have been Fiona, um, and and men had an average of something like 1.5 or something. And once we introduced the, the the changes in the maternity maternity policy or leave policy, parental leave policy, now the numbers are almost identical for men and women when they achieve ten, tenure. So that's a huge change. But again, I think there are many areas where we, where we need to see things. We see more women um, in that um, associate professor stuck place, not getting the second book out for two reasons. One, they're often asked to take on certain leadership roles in the campus, and that sort of often can slow them down. And then secondly, they have the family responsibilities. And so those two things tend to work um, towards making the pathway a little bit more challenging for, for women. Uh, but things are definitely better. I will say, though, my field, mechanical engineering, I think still has 3% doctoral students. I don't know why. It's a great field. Um, so <laughs> we, we have work to do in that area. <laughs> I will say that when my children were small, I used to love business travel. It was so relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and then, you know, I, sort of, I didn't have to worry about anybody else. I could go to sleep when I wanted to. And then when I came back, my husband was really grateful to see me. <laughs> So if we're talking about gender as sort of a differentiator of experience, and it remains so, I, to bring it back to the students for a second, we've also seen a lot of anecdotal and even some sort of database reporting about students and basic needs, about the differentiation of experience due to socioeconomic differences. What are you seeing, let me start with you, Kathy, what are, what are you seeing in the undergraduate realm? To what degree is it a significant problem? And how do you think the campus is, what kind of job are we doing in terms of responding, whether it's about food, shelter, and other supportive services for students with basic needs? So everybody has basic needs. I mean, all students need a place to sleep, food to eat, those kinds of things. And I think we're, I, I want to put a framing around this. I think we want to create a healthy campus where there's an emphasis on, on wellness in, in a broad sense. And that means you know, sleep, food, nutrition. There's a subset of our student population that really runs on the ragged edge. 
And uh, we're still unpacking what that is because we offer fairly generous financial aid packages um, to many of our students. I think there's two populations that, that, that have a harder time. One is the population of students who are um, still helping to support families at home mm. or have dependents of their own here. And we don't cover that in the financial aid package. We cover what they, their cost as a student is, but they're often that second job is not to pay their rent. That second job is often money that's being sent home. And that's an interesting challenge. Another one is cultural um, inhibition around taking out loans. Our average student debt is, is remarkably low for the population we have. We're what under, is it? I think, our, I think we're inching up to about seventeen dollars or $18,000 at the end of their time. That's out of their self-help. But um, that's just for the students who have debt. That, and uh, that's uh, just for the students who have debt. There's a huge part of our students who don't have any debt at all. So some of them are fine. Then there's the group that probably should have taken out student loans and have compromised mm -hmm. their experience here because they're afraid to go into debt. So they don't have debt, but they've also other things. And I will say this, for every student who stays that extra semester and doesn't graduate in four, that extra semester costs them in ways that I don't think we talk about enough. It costs them in terms of foregone earnings. It adds to their debt burden. Um, it is a, it's a risky business, and if you actually look at the data on that, it's sobering what that extra semester costs. Wow. And so, you know, part of our dialogue and thinking about this is actually helping them see the best way that they can both leverage their experience here, really use their summers, for example, for certain kinds of experiences or, or making up courses or adding to their, their, their toolbox. But, but graduating in four carries a lot of benefits that we don't talk about, and this is, this is one of them. The other population that I, say is I want to say is squeezed is our middle class population, mm -hmm. whose parents, so it's not so much the student as much as their parents are squeezed, because FAFSA works really well for you, our low income, the financial aid, federal financial aid form, whatever that, it's called a FAFSA. And when you put your application in, there's a really hot, strong benefit for students who are, whose family incomes are under $80,000. Between 80000 and 170000 it's basically like every dollar that's available is supposed to go to your kid's education and never mind every other cost that you may have. And then above 170000 you probably have a ways to do that. And so there's another group that we don't talk about very much, which is this middle class population that, that the burden is on their families more than it is on the student. And, and that's another population to be aware of and to think about. And then what do, Fiona. What do you see in your realm, Fiona? We have a lot of graduate students who are really struggling to make ends meet. So we've, I mean, we've got different, um, here I need to distinguish between my different um, yeah. populations. student populations. Yeah. Um, so um, if we look at the professional students, first of all, many of them have been out of college for a few mm. years, sometimes um, a decade or so. Um, and are more established. Quite a lot, um, we've got quite a few who are online, so they're continuing to live um, with their families and so on. Um, those students typically fund their education either from savings or they take out loans, but they aren't eligible for the federal aid that benefits undergraduate. Um, I've had conversations with many professional students who basically said, I'm paying so much in tuition, I'm jolly well going to make sure that I eat properly and that I live somewhere reasonable because that way I can make the best of my um, you know, tuition. Um, I'm going to come to class well, well fed and well rested so that I get my money's worth. Um, so those students are kind of taking the long um, view, particularly um, in programs that then have the promise of high income. Within my doctoral students, there are really two distinctive um, sort of sectors. One is students who are in STEM fields, where there is a significant ability for the student to be paid as a graduate student researcher mm -hmm. while they're doing the research on their doctorate. So those students um, can go through their programs pretty quickly and they are usually um, fa fairly well supported. Obviously, they're, they're not living in luxury, but they have um, adequate support. Um, there are also students in um, what I sort of generalize as the book-based disciplines 
where there is very little um, funded extramural research. And as such, these students don't have very much of an opportunity to be employed as a graduate student researcher while doing the work that's going to go into their dissertations. Those students are supported on combination of fellowships and also serving as graduate student instructors. And so they have less time to work on their um, research, so it takes them longer, so they're in sort of challenged circumstances for longer. And, and then kind of overarching all of this um, in terms of basic needs is the fact that there's a chronic shortage of housing for graduate students. So Berkeley is only housing at the moment 9% of its graduate students, principally students with families. And so um, the rest are vying for um, housing on the, um, sort of the, the sort of free market, um, and it's very expensive. So when they're paying rent, then they don't have money available for food and the like. Got it. Um, so I'm really glad that the campus is moving to increase the amount of housing available for grad students. Yeah. So we're going to move to some questions from the audience. We're going to stick with the theme of money and finance <laughs> in this first, and this is a two-parter. Where does private philanthropy have the greatest impact in each of your areas? And connected to that, what is your core message to the alumni community at Berkeley regarding their engagement and investment in our faculty and students? Kathy, let me start with you. Where does private, where's the greatest bang for the buck in private philanthropy and what's your basic message to alumni and, and donors? Oh, that's an interesting question, biggest bang for your buck. I think, well, Probably at the undergraduate level, the, the biggest bang for the buck, and I, I'm going to say that there's sort of two places where I'd like to see this. One is um, just purely undergraduate financial aid. That just the more we have in our own control for financial aid, the better we are able to support our students. So that's the, the, the if I'm going to say one big thing, I mean, I would like to see us have a, I'm going to probably shake up anybody from UDAR, but I'd like to see us have a $500 million goal for financial aid in the next capital campaign, at least. And that's undergraduate financial aid. That's not even going to graduate fellowships. And then the second piece of that is um, support for students to be able to engage in the discovery experiences. So whether that's an offset to their expected contribution, their student contribution, their, their, their loan and work expectation, um, monies to travel, um, monies to actually engage in discovery so that there's an equitable playing field so that all students have that opportunity, not just those that are that are well resourced. So those are the those are the that's the, probably the biggest thing that I would see, and I think alumni engagement is essential. This is a great place to invest in, um, and and I would love to see, you know, all of us making that making an investment um, in in this institution. It is a remarkable engine of opportunity. Our ability to move a student from the lowest quintile financially to the top is one of the best in the country. Um, again, our students leave with less debt than they do in many, many institutions. It's comparable to my alma mater, which is a private institution. Um, I, I think that commitment, um, paying it forward mm. um, for those of us that, that benefited, um, I think is an important part of what we do. And you know, every, every gift matters. I mean, it matters if you can make an annual contribution. It matters if you can make a capital contribution. Mm -hmm. um, both of those are important to, to the future of this institution and to um, making our students um, be able to take advantage of everything this place has to offer. Fiona, same deal. Where would you like to see, what, what do you think the primary goal for philanthropic contributions to your part of the world should be and what the message is? Well, I've got, in terms of bang for the buck, I have so many needs that I'm, I'm, great, I'm, I'm grateful. I can, I can ensure that anything that anybody is inclined to fund um, will have a big impact. Uh, so um, certainly fellowship support for students is enormously important. Just to put, put in perspective the magnitude of that need, if we look at the amount of support that we're providing to doctoral students at the moment and the amount of money that we need to actually bring each of them up to um, the stipend that NSF considers an appropriate one, which is, I think it's 33 or 34,000 a year, we need an additional 1.4 billion with a B in endowment. So. Um, any contributions will help, um, but there's, there's, there's a big, big hole there um, that needs filling. But there are also, um, one can have incredible impact by 
supporting some of our incredible um, current use activities. Um, one of my pushes is to provide more programming for grad students on professional development so that they're prepared for a variety of careers, not just um, academic careers. And that's actually a great place for alumni to be engaged because um, as an academic institution, we have this institutional bias where we kind of convey to our students that um, sort of the, the most common career path is actually being professors, which is actually not true. The statistics bear this out. And engage, having alumni engaged to actually inform our students about their own career paths and success is an incredibly powerful way to get engaged, and that complements the expertise that we have as an academic institution. And so here's, and here's a question that came from the audience that's right in that same vein, but for a different part of our stakeholder set, and that the question is this, is there any plan or program that staff can get involved in so that they can mentor undergraduate students in the areas of discovery experience or mental support or whatever? I mean, just a rough look, you're just, we predominantly a staff audience here, and I think people love this place and want to be more involved. What kind of opportunities are there? Well, we're, we're really beginning to explore that area and think about it because we think that there is an opportunity for, for staff. Um, we had a conversation um, uh, you know, yesterday around um, housing and, and one of the areas for you know, great, greater development for the RD staff um, working with our students and just thinking about their mentoring role in, in that. But there, there are many opportunities that we're, we're talking about especially staff who are, in, who are in either like the technical fields and in, in IT and other areas, that's an area where we have students who really have great ideas and, and want to do things. So that's just one example. I don't want to limit it to that. Sure. But, but um, I think we can, as we begin to roll out discovery and think about the dimensions we're thinking about for discovery experiences, I'll just say briefly, classic undergraduate research projects where you have a senior thesis or you know, a, a portfolio you develop, Creative ones where you're, you're per, perhaps your project is a performance or um, co-curating a museum exhibition, something along those lines, an entrepreneurial project or a community engagement project. And you could imagine in certain areas there are opportunities for staff all along the line to mentor, not, not just, as I said, the classic things that, that have a faculty member as, the, as a mentor. And I just say that throughout my career, I have seen staff be incredibly effective mentors for both undergraduate and graduate students on an informal basis. Um, some, you know, it, it's something that has risen organically, kind of within departments, where um, something clicks between the student and the staff person. I've seen this, for example, um, staff who are mothers kind of mentoring grad students who've had babies um, and just kind of helping them out and um, Sometimes, you know, there's a student who's come from a non-traditional background and there's a staff member who can relate to them and they provide a little bit of just help and advice. They're there to listen to. And that's incredibly powerful in terms of helping the student feel that they belong in the institution, that they're valued. And, you know, frankly, just helping them navigate some of these difficult um, situations. Great. So I want to go, we're going to go back to the undergraduate world here. Um, so as Many people may know, but not all, so I'm going to ask you to talk a little about it. There's part of the strategic planning for the campus is sort of a new vision for undergraduate education. Um, so I'd like you just to describe briefly what that vision is, what it entails, but also address the following question here, too, about staff. How will staff be involved in the implementation of the undergraduate education and related recommendations of the strategic plan? It states here that, obviously, that staff run facilities, scheduling, support the campus in all sorts of aspects and their input is critical at the planning stage of the initiatives. So I think the question is, how are staff going to be able to provide input and participate in what is sort of this new emerging vision for the future of our undergraduate education here? So a little about what it is and how to be involved. How to be involved. So the, the vision really, as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, was the, is the idea of discovery as the organizing principle for the undergraduate experience. So from the time that they begin to engage with the campus in, in you know, before they even are, are admitted, 
that they are choosing Berkeley because of the, the potential for the discovery experience, the potential to, to um, co-create with faculty, the potential to pursue their passions, and, and to make that visible and, and the reason that students are choosing Berkeley over another institution. Then moving through into their very first experience, um, organizing our courses, things like Berkeley Connect, discovery courses, introductory courses um, that have them explore something. I was talking with a colleague yesterday whose introductory bioengineering course involves having students look at a, 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 a product or, or something that's been, been developed and sort of go back in time and understand how did that product evolve? What were the decisions that were made that ended up with that? And what were the alternatives? Was, was there, is there a better way to achieve that same outcome? That's a freshman course. That's really exciting because it starts right away getting students thinking about, about what it means to discover something. And then they, he said they actually tie that then to what they're expecting their students to do in the capstone. So that's the idea that there's sort of an arc of discovery in the, the curriculum that we go from this beginning, we move through the various stages, building capacity, building, building skills, and then finally have them have an, a, a discovery experience that is a capstone in, in, their, in what they do. Um, so that's the, that's the vision of the, at least the academic portion, and that, that surrounding that would be all of the things that make that possible, and the potential for then having discovery through an experience with the public service center, or helping them have an internship that helps them guide what they might ultimately do. So there's a there's a larger landscape around not just the academic piece, but all the other pieces that support that 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 those developments. So staff are going to be really critical in, say, the Career Center, um, where helping, actually I've heard from all the undergraduate deans that they are desperate for better support around internships because they're being inundated by requests from students and none of us know <clears throat> completely how to do that. So that's going to take a partnership between the colleges and, and the Career Center to sort of build that out in a, in a meaningful way. Same thing with the Public Service Center. Interesting, a faculty who love it, engage with it, use it, students who are involved in it, and I have faculty who didn't even know we had one. That was an interesting outcome of some of the conversations I had over the summer. So we have work to do in terms of what are the resources and support, and, and again, staff in those programs become vitally important um, for that. Those are just two of the direct examples I can think of, but many, many other places. And I think we'll be working on, on ways in which um, staff can engage. Um, one project I said we mentioned, this major maps project is gonna be a partnership with um, the registrar's office, the academic guide, with um, some advisors who can help us work on, on, on those tools, um, with folks in, in other areas of the campus to, to be involved with that. So, Super. Um, stay tuned. No, let me let, just say one thing quickly. Sure, please. This rollout, this development, is a five to 10 year process. Mm. So this is not gonna happen overnight. And we're all stretched, so the idea is we'll chunk off things each year that we think we can make progress on. So it's just not gonna happen in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be an evolving process. And this year we're focused on major maps, the first year experience, um, and, and some strategies around um, uh, diversity and admitting a, a, a diverse class and putting in the, in the stakes to become an HSI. Those are, those are kind of the big picture things. We're so alas, we only have time for another question or two, and I have some really good questions here, so I'm gonna ask those people who submitted a question and didn't get it answered, if you want to come up, just write your name on the back of the card. Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and commit both of you to responding <laughs> sure. via email afterwards, so I apologize that we, we didn't get to everything. Um, so last two, the, the next one is about rankings, and this person asked that the recent US News ranking put Berkeley behind UCLA. Settle. Um, do we know why there was a drop in can we, they put in quotes, recover? Um, so I should just note that actually Berkeley didn't drop, UCLA came up, but having yeah. said that, you know, this is, this is the season of schizophrenia where, you know, the rankings come into our office, so that's a good ranking, that ranking sucks, and you can guess which one said what. And they, say, they seem to be all over the map. H how do you guys look at rankings, and how important is it, and, Help us, help us with our neurosis about this. So, so I, I, let, let, me, let me say that, that this US News and World Report was not on the graduate stuff, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Fiona. <laughs> well. Well. <laughs> but but it's, it's, a, it's the same thing, you know. Um, we, 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 um, I mean, when you dig down into the surveys, um, the methodology 
it is phenomenally important on the outcome of the rankings, and that's what happened with the new US, US mm -hmm. News um, and World Report. Because, um, well, you you can well, chime in. It basically, was the they Pell changed Grant. they changed two weighting factors on two of the categories that um, disadvantaged Berkeley. They were ones that we were so academic reputation got downgraded. I, you know. <laughs> We are still, you know, one of the top, you know, from a graduate perspective, we're in the top four, and, and, it, and sometimes we're one, sometimes we're two, and it depends on the field. But they downgraded the overall, the weight on that, which hurt us, helped UCLA, um, who's not as strong as we are. Um, and, and then there was one other factor where the same thing happened. So, let me interrupt and let me just say, let me just say, this is all about selling the, 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 the magazine. report, the magazine. Yes. So, so they tweak this all the time. Um, I've been through this on my alma mater when I was I was on the board, and 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 we got slammed because our endowment per student as a top liberal arts college is much less than Williams Wellesley. Mm -hmm. So you know those things. In one year, we went from being fourth because of the weight on academic rankings and things to being like ninth because they switched the financial framework and had nothing to do again with the student experience or the academic. Ranking so right. really quickly. Is so, there a so, ranking so, that you care about that you follow? Um, you know, I, frankly, I think no. any 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 ranking in the top twenty indicates that this place is going to give a darn good education. Any, any ranking? But, but, but let, let me just say, just as an example of how crazy some of these are, there's um, one of the rankings in Asia recently ranked Berkeley as number eleven in the world in mining. Do you know how many faculty members on this campus do mining? That's me. <laughs> Number 11. Yay. So all that shows is that it's totally crazy because we're not that strong on binding, I can tell you. <laughs> all right. Uh, last question. We're not going to let Fiona go without taking a little bit of a victory lap. Because, and this question is going to help us do that. Fiona, you are about to retire, I'm told. Um, what is the one thing you're most proud of from your tenure as, as dean, and what is the major issue that your successor should tackle? It's going to be the last question. Um, I think that, that there's the same things. I think that I've um, improved the funding for individual students, and we've um, raised a lot of philanthropic money. And I think that we have got things going to change the conversation about the um, careers that doctoral recipients should be um, re receiving. And these are issues that my successor is going to have to continue on, because we're not there. We've made a lot of progress. I'm proud of it. But there's sure a lot of work <laughs> yet to be done. Yeah. Got it. So just to wrap up, the next Canvas conversation is going to be on October 15th with the Vice Chancellor for Research, Randy Katz. I have to say this was, as Fiona would say, a jolly good conversation. <laughs> um, and I really want to thank both of you for being open and out there. Thank you.